Welcome to Court Rise with me, Martin Pebu. This is episode two, and today we're going to deal with the matter of the participation of chiefs in partisan politics in Ghana. This is a matter that has raised a lot of debate, and actually far, it's an unending debate. It's been around for as far as this constitution, 1992, has been in existence and operation. So the format for today's episode is that we will discuss the Supreme Court decision, uh, Elam Kwame Goni versus Attorney General, and the constitutional provisions therein on chief, chiefs not participating in active party politics. Then the next part of this session would be asking practical questions and also interweaving it with the jurisprudence in other countries. You will look at the Zambian example of saying that chiefs should not participate in active politics at all. That a provision that appears to be more drastic than the Ghanaian one, but perhaps having the same effect. So now we may go into the case of Elam Kwame Goni, the Attorney General. Now this is a case that was filed in the Supreme Court to essentially clarify, among others, the meaning of active party politics as used in Article 276 of the Constitution 1992. It's also the case that the plaintiff, uh, Ms. Agoni, wanted the Supreme Court to declare that certain statements made by some chiefs in the run-up to the 2020 elections constituted participation in active party politics. The third one was that he wanted a declaration that an endorsement by a chief of any presidential or parliamentary candidate prior to, during, and after a presidential election amounts to a breach of Article 276 Clause 1 of the Constitution 1992 of Ghana, and same amounts to an engagement in active party politics, as purposed and intended under, under Article 276 of the Constitution 1992. So these are basically the three things that we would say, or the three uh, reliefs, yes. So when I say things, it means reliefs. When you, go, when you go to court, what you ask from the court is called a relief, the word relief, R-E-L-I-E-F. <laughs> so these are the reliefs that Mr. Goni sought. Now, having filed that writ, the defendant, that's the attorney general, had to also respond. So in court, usually when you start a case, you file your papers, and the other side to response. I'm talking specifically about these uh, constitutional matters. There are other ones that differ, but I'm talking about the constitutional matters. And even the constitutional matters, I'm just talking about what is relevant for the purpose of this episode. So I should not be taking us giving a lecture on uh, constitutional litigation here. No, I'm just talking about the salient ones for this uh, uh, podcast. So having filed the plaintiff's case, the defendant has to respond. It's worthy of note that Mr. Goni also made the National House of Chiefs a party. So it was the case was against the Attorney General and the National House of Chiefs. But after a long while, the National House of Chiefs failed to respond. So in order to let the matter proceed, Mr. Goni went back to court and removed the National House of Chiefs. So that is how come the National House of Chiefs was no longer a party to the case. So it's only the Attorney General. Now, when the Attorney General responded, he, of course, is his office, though even every case is in the name of the Attorney General. Whether he himself writes the brief or not, we keep saying the Attorney General, even though in this particular case you find that the lawyer who would participate or represent him may not be the Attorney General himself. So in this particular case, it wasn't the Attorney General himself who held or who did the arguments. There was a lawyer, and we don't need to mention his name for these purposes. So the Attorney General's arguments are basically, if I may just put them, maybe five. They are all very interrelated. Number one, the argument was that active party politics is very clear, so there's no need at all for the Supreme Court to go into this matter. Yeah, that's the argument of the Attorney General. 
and that by saying it's very clear, the Attorney General meant that the active simply means, that's his, his reading of Article 276, Clause 1, simply means that a chief is engaged in active party politics if he puts himself up for election. That is to say, if he contests election as a candidate, either as a parliamentary candidate or a presidential candidate. So for the Attorney General, that was it. And to be very clear, the Attorney General further argued that when a chief endorses a candidate, it is harmless because a chief cannot ensure that the people, I don't like the word subject, we are grown, so we're developing, so I say his people, right? So he can't ensure that his people vote for his candidate because there's no way for him to enforce it. After all, each candidate, each voter goes into the booth alone to vote, right? So for the Attorney General, an endorsement is harmless. Now, the Attorney General also made the argument that curtailing chief's participation in active party politics means that their rise to freedom of speech, freedom of thought and conscience are being curtailed. So chiefs should be allowed to participate in active party politics. So essentially, those are the arguments. So the court had to go into it to determine whether the case really tests a stance or merits the attention of the court. The court looked at it and thought that, yes, the word active party politics has not been defined. And it's also the case that it's not all the time. Or the active party politics doesn't mean just putting up yourself for election. That's key. So you see that just at that juncture, you see that the attorney general's main argument is beginning to fall apart. Yes, the court made a determination in trying to see whether it should go into the case. It identified a gap in the Attorney General's definition of active party politics. And that gap is that the court saw that a person may engage in active party politics, but may not put himself up as a candidate, either presidential or parliamentary. And so once there is that gap in what the Attorney General connotes as a mean of active party politics, then it tells you that, yes, really, this is a matter that the court should go into to give further clarity. Good. So, and I already mentioned the three things that the uh, plaintiffs sought to get from the court. That's a pronouncement that certain chiefs had endorsed certain candidates, specifically the MPP's candidate, President Kufuadu, and the NDC's candidate, uh, ex-president John Mahama, and that those conducts amounted it to a breach of Article 276, Clause 1. And thirdly, the plaintiff wanted an explanation, a definition of the term active party politics. So with this, the Supreme Court went into the matter. Now, there isn't enough time for us to be able to go through the analysis bit by bit. We would just go in for the summary. But it is worthy of note that in our history, that's in our past. There were times that, in actual fact, this is how it starts. Initially, you know, chiefs have always been political heads. So there's the Native Authority Act. There were chiefs who were in the legislature, etc. So it's very crucial to appreciate that chiefs played such a huge and central role in the local government system in Ghana. We had the Native Authority Act in which the chief provided lots of services. And apart from that also, chiefs could go to parliament. So in the legislature, they were there, right? And other instances. Now, fast forward, it got to a point, the chiefs themselves realized that as a result of the division, etc., that participation in active party politics brought into their uh, society or brought amongst their people, they didn't want to participate again. So the chiefs themselves wrote a memo to the government that they didn't want to be involved in active party politics. So from the Association of Chiefs, okay, in the colonial era, 1951, yeah, thereabout. So you see, this is part of our history. A situation in which chiefs were actively involved, then they came to a part, they said they wouldn't 
participate again. And before they didn't, there was one of the elections in the early 50s, three chiefs stood as candidates and lost. Yes, three very eminent chiefs stood as, can as candidates and lost. You may read the decision to find out those chiefs. I don't need to mention names here right now. So after all of this, they discovered that for the unity of Ghana, among others, they didn't want to participate in active party politics. So they should be taken out. So fast forward, the Supreme Court looked at all of that history and then arrived at the current dispensation. That's the Constitution 1992. And in the Constitution 1992, there is the provision of Article 276, Clause 1, which says that chiefs should not participate in active party politics. So now, before we deal with the decision of the Supreme Court, let's read the provision. Article 276, Clause 1 reads, A chief shall not take part in active party politics, and any chief wishing to do so and seeking election in parliament shall abdicate his stool or skin. Let's read for emphasis. A chief shall not take part in active party politics and any chief wishing to do so and seeking election to parliament shall abdicate his stool or Skin. Great. So, you see, reading the provision, the Supreme Court found that there are some key elements in it. You see the active party politics. That's the first part. And it goes on to say, and any chief wishing to do so, that is to say, wishing to do active party politics, has to resign. So, a chief wishing to do active party politics has to resign which is separate from, then you come, and seeking election in parliament shall abdicate his stool or skin. So the point is that you see that after active party politics, the provision goes on to make the point that an any chief wishing to do so, so that tells you that any chief wishing to do active party politics, that's one part of it. Before the provision goes on to talk about and seeking election. So the point is that active party politics is not only about election. So you remember I mentioned earlier that the Attorney General's argument began to unravel as soon as they said for Attorney General, active party politics meant that the chief putting himself up for election as a presidential candidate or parliamentary one, anything short of that was not active. So you see that the provision itself is very clear that active party politics is not only about elections. That's why the provision say any and any person wishing to do active party politics, it's separate from, and then continues by saying, and any person seeking election. So seeking election is just a subset of active party politics. That is very key. Yes, let's make this point. Seeking election is just a subset of active party politics. So with this analysis, the Supreme Court came to the conclusion that uh, a chief may be caught in active party politics without putting himself up for, uh, this for election. Now, so the next part, having so determined, then the Supreme Court looked at the endorsement. At the end of all the analysis, the Supreme Court came to a decision that a chief shall not endorse any particular candidate, be it presidential or parliamentary. No endorsement. However, it is within the right of a chief to praise or criticize government programs and projects. Let's get a distinction. Don't endorse any particular person, but you may praise or criticize government projects. Yes, and to a large extent, it's good that chiefs can praise or criticize government projects. But then you may find that in implementing the decision, it appears there will be a leeway for chiefs to participate in active party politics despite the Supreme Court decision. That is, in the attempt by a chief to praise government policies, it may well be a form of endorsement. So let's take a practical example. 
a chief who says, let's say a presidential candidate goes to the territory of a chief, and then at the Deba, the chief informs the citizens, oh, this particular candidate, his government built this road. This is quite a game changer. This road that they built in this community, joining uh, this community to the next one, or making for easy transportation, etc., has changed our lives. This is a game changer. This is a generational project. It will bring us dividends generations upon generations. And that is something that we will forever be grateful for. Blah, blah, blah. Now, you can imagine the power of words. Once the chief uses so many adjectives and extols the virtues of the program, what will that do? It is possible that it will send a signaling effect to some of the people that Nana likes this candidate. And so the citizens may be willing, or the people may be towing Nana's line, or well, they will be reading, interpreting Nana's words to mean that he supports that candidate, and so they will vote. Well, it doesn't appear there's much that we can do about it because when it comes to words, it doesn't look like the Supreme Court can cut down or can restrict, can determine or regulate the kind of words that can be used. But I'm making the point that depending on how the chief speaks, it may be more than an express endorsement. That is the point. So it's all about language. Now let's look at another chief who says, or the same chief, criticizes a certain government project for being riddled with corruption. This project you put up, so for example, I understand it costs one million Ghana cities. I've never understood why this project should cost one million Ghana cities. I understand it could have been done with 200,000. These are some of the projects that have, what, retarded this country's growth. One project swallowing up about five other projects and so on and on and on. So that's a criticism. The chief is allowed to criticize. Now, depending on the words that are used, do you see that some of the people may take it that Nana is not happy with that particular candidate's government or that particular candidate if the, 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 that their previous uh, 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 party, that's if between the two dominant political parties, okay? Right. So in that context, it may be that Nana doesn't like them, so, and so on and so forth. Take another example. These ones don't fit into the first category. When the chief comments about a national project or national governance, depending on how it is done, it will be lauded as being very patriotic. So last year, 2023, or the second, it's reported to have stated on Monday, 20th March, 2023, Daily Graphic, page 16. The caption is, demonstrate transparency on economy as anti to government. When you go on, you find in the story he talks about the debt exchange, he talks about fiscal discipline, we need to do fiscal discipline, and complains that there is no transparency. And you know, these are matters that resonate with us as citizens. So when you read this story, then you are happy that yes, Asante Hini has put his foot down and he's commenting. So you think that, yes, that's a strong message to government. I hope it's not uh, motivated by us because, yeah, motivated by us where a person develops and holds opinions that advance his own desires, right? Uh, but I hope it's not motivated by us because this one, we are talking about ga the governance of Ghana. We need Ghana to get better, right? So you find this one, we don't immediately read politics into it because it's what? A comment on the whole of the government system. You look at another one recently, Ochihini has decried the corruption in Ghana. Yes, he has said that corruption is such a big problem and so government should set up. You see that, yes, this also is talking about government programs not being up to scratch, not being able to fight corruption. So you see that this one too is a broad spectrum, so you may not specifically read into it that he doesn't like this particular government or that one. So you may find, the point is that you may find other comments that may not amount to an endorsement, even though they are criticisms or praises. 
So that is a lot that we have. You may multiply the examples, or you look at another one, though this one uh, is not a chief, but I'm throwing it in to also show that sometimes when you have senior public servants make certain comments, they resonate with citizens and may not be read as what politics. So you look at this one, uh, Thursday, September 28, 2023. CJ advocates financial independence of the judiciary. This was at the bar conference, and you find that this is a, a chief justice asking for independence. This is something uh, of the judiciary, and this is something we've been fighting for to make the justice system more independent of government, etc. So you see that this resonates well with us. As I said, this is not a pure chief tenancy matter, but throwing it into just show how certain comments may resonate with the people. So having stated this, you would find that the Supreme Court may have given a decision, but when it comes to the implementation, because of the power of language, depending on the skills of the person speaking, he may speak and not mention names, but that message he sends across may be more powerful than an endorsement, an express endorsement, I mean, yes may be more powerful than saying, oh, my people, I want you to vote for Mr. A or Mr. B. No, depending on how Nana speaks. Oh, one very other example is one in which a certain presidential candidate went to a certain area to campaign. Then the chief got up and said, oh, Mr. X, I've known Mr. X for such a long time, decades. And actually, fact, Mr. X was even my lawyer, he was my personal lawyer. When the chief says this, does he, does he need to say vote for him? Depending on how it is said, if Nana says, I've known Mr. X for decades and he was even my personal lawyer. Ah, I certainly see that in certain contexts, this is heavier and this is more resounding than an express endorsement that vote for Mr. X. If a chief were to just say vote for Mr. X with adducing reasons, I don't think it will make as much impact as when he himself has testified to the virtues of Mr. X for decades, but doesn't go on to say that, so I entreat you to vote for Mr. X. So at this juncture, it's instructive for us to look at the reasons for the Supreme Court decision, that is to say, why ban chief from active party politics, but also in the same breath, say that a chief may praise a government project or criticize him, but may not endorse a candidate personally. So the Supreme Court, having reviewed all the literature, accepted the time-honored argument that a chief embodies the soul of the people. The chief is a unifier. The chief leads his people in development, etc. And so the Supreme Court thought that if chiefs were allowed to participate in active politics, same would bring about this unity in the communities or let's say the state or pol uh, 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 society. Let's hear the Supreme Court specifically on those points. We are led to this conclusion by the belief that such an interpretation best vindicates the principles and policy rationale or intent behind Article 276 Clause 1, which is that chiefs must not take sides or be seen to have taken sides in a political, in a partisan political contest. As to do so, risk creating or exacerbating social divisions to the detriment of their communities and damaging the prestige, honor, and reverence of the stool, skin, and the chief's office. So that's the first point. So you see why the Supreme Court said they had to do it. And then the Supreme Court goes on to make the second point, that we acknowledge 
that the interpretation of Article 276 Clause 1 we endorse here constitutes a restriction of the fundamental right of chiefs to freedom of speech and expression as well as freedom of thought and belief. However, we believe that Article 276 Clause 1, which is of equal constitutional status, is a narrowly tailored and reasonable restriction on the rights of chiefs and is in light of the history and the importance of the concerns at stake justifiable in the public interest. In this, we are again in accord with Nana S.K.B. Asante, who has also expressed the opinion that, to the extent that this prohibition constitutes a restriction on the fundamental rights of chiefs, such restriction is justifiable in the public interest. So you get the point. Then the Supreme Court goes on to make the point that chiefs are not the only ones whose rights have been what restricted. That's to say the right to freedom of speech, etc. The Supreme Court makes the point that the Commission of Charge, the Electoral Commission, the NCC Commissioner, the uh, Chairperson of the NCC, the judges, etc. They also have their rights more or less restricted because they can't take part in what active party politics. So it's a restriction that is reasonable in our constitution, 1992. Now, beyond the decision, some people have raised concerns that what is the remedy when a chief, foul, sorry, when a chief falls foul of this constitutional provision at 276 clause 1. Why hasn't the Supreme Court provided a remedy? Maybe the chief be distilled, etc. Well, there's jurisprudence a bit in it. Then in one of the Tiger PI cases resulting from the ANAS documentary, the Supreme Court has made the point that perhaps we may have to look at that. That may be the subject for constitutional amendment in future. Yeah, because you see, if you want to use this as grounds to distill a chief, it has to be expressly provided for by law. Otherwise, you can't just say that based on this Supreme Court decision, if a chief is engaged in party politics, based on the Supreme Court decision alone, you are having him uh, distilled. So we may look at that in future. And it's also important to make the point too that the Supreme Court also consider the other examples of active party politics, the overt participation in politics, and said those ones don't pose a challenge. So, for example, the chief appearing at a political party rally and speaking. Obviously, I mean, speaking at a rally to support a candidate. Obviously, that is active party politics. So the Supreme Court looked at that. Uh, actually, those were definitions given in the Constituent Assembly. Yes, that participation in a, a rally, wearing party JCs and pa other party, using other party paraphernalia, etc., making a contribution to the party and all that. Supreme Court looked at that. Those are definitions that were given in them. So those are clear examples. Those don't, those don't provide a challenge at all. The Constitution Review Commission made a comparison with the Zambian Constitution saw that in Zambia, there's a complete ban on chiefs participating in politics. This is the comment of the commission at page 534. It says, the Zambian constitution bans chiefs completely from politics and provides that a person shall not, while remaining a chief, join or participate in partisan politics. The commission observes that there is no mention of active politics in this provision, and more so, participation in party politics is not defined in that constitution. That notwithstanding, the provision may have the same effect as pertains in Ghana. So that's just to give uh, comparative jurisprudence what pertains in Zambia. The 
it's also worthy of note that the commission found that in South Africa there's no such provision. So let's read the comment. It says, the South African constitution is silent on whether a traditional ruler may or may not take part in active party politics. Then let's go to Uganda. The Ugandan constitution of 1995 provides that a person shall not, while remaining a traditional leader or cultural leader, join or participate in partisan politics. That constitution also does not define partisan politics. On Botswana, this is what the commission says. The Botswana constitution of 1966 reserves the position of specially elected member of the National House of Chiefs to persons who have not, within the preceding five years, actively engaged in politics. The Botswana constitution does not explain what constitutes being actively engaged in politics in the section referred to. So at least we've had some comparative jurisprudence where we've seen that in Uganda, Zambia, and uh, the Botswana one, you see that there are attempts to, in similar fashion, keep chiefs away from active party politics. It's the South African one that is silent on it. So we'll find out the practical jurisprudence in another episode. So having made all these excuses with this exposition, the question that remains is that it is clear that we will certainly need more interpretation, more decisions on this matter to be able to chart a clearer path on our governance system. Because much as we recognize that chiefs are such a critical component of our governance, governance architecture, we are also anxious to ensure that chiefs do not participate in active party politics in such a manner as to ruin the institution of chieftaincy as even recognized by the Supreme Court. And let's be uh, uh, remind, quickly remind ourselves that the Supreme Court had to look at the writings of so many eminent jurists, eminent writers on the institution of chieftains, including Rathbone and other professors who have studied this institution and have seen that the role that chieftaincy plays, especially in unifying the people and organizing people for development, etc., is such a critical component of our governance system that it should be guarded jealously. So every attempt should be made to make sure that that institution works in a way to better our governance, but not to sow seeds of discourse, calumny, etc., among the citizenry. Thank you very much. This has been another episode of Court Rise with me, Martin Pebu. Look forward to more episodes soon, dear listeners, and thank you very much for your attention. For God and country.